This episode is brought to you by Arden Labs Education. Sign up today to learn advanced concepts in Go, Docker, Kubernetes, Terraform, and more. Visit ardenlabs.com forward slash education for more information. Hi, and welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. Our special guest today is Martin Gallagher. Martin, where are you coming from today? Hi, Bill. I'm, I'm in London today. This is my, in my home office here. Yeah, I'm so jealous, man. I love London. Oh, yeah. I love London. <laughs> I got I to gotta get all this stuff. The world's got to come back to normal. And then um, Berlin and London, that's on my list. Like, immediately get on a plane. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, funny, we were at the Go, GopherCon UK conference last week. That was the first in-person thing that I've been in for two, for two years. And that was, uh, that was fantastic, just to see everyone again. Yeah, I saw everything on Twitter. So uh, I was, again, yeah, little um, what, FOMO. <laughs> <on that. laughs> All right. So why don't you give everybody like just two minutes um, what you're doing today? Okay. So um, basically, I'm a specialist Go recruiter. So I've been I've been a recruiter for 25 years, but now I've um, basically I run my company is called Vistas Recruitment. Um, it's a small company. It's me and my wife also works part time with me, but uh, we just focus on trying to find excellent go related individuals to work for various companies that, that, that can't get in touch with me to try and find them some good people um typically the companies i work with are based in in and around uk and europe um so i basically focus spend all my day talking to gophers and uh trying to do my best and uh put, put, put people together with with interesting companies really when I started my professional career back in like 90, I mean, I guess I started in 91, but when I moved from New York to Miami, I met a, a recruiter and the guy was amazing. Like, I still talk to this guy today. I, when you find someone, and I feel like you're in that camp because we've met and I've talked to you. When you find someone like yourself, it could be a life, a, a, a professional life relationship which is really valuable to everybody so you know it's and one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because you know I, I put you in that kind of camp of recruiters that are just not just in it for the money they're in it to make sure that people are are taking care of their families like, like the whole thing you know what I'm saying yeah and I'm yeah. really interested in hearing your kind of backstory on on how you got into this business and how you're staying in this business and and also how you end up becoming really a specialist uh, in the Go space, right? Because that's, that's super interesting. So what I want to do is kind of get you back into the time machine. Um, we're going to have to age you a little bit, but <laughs> hey, it's okay. We're going to have to do that. Um, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, even though you're a recruiter, you're a recruiter in the technical field. So I, I imagine that you have some form of a technical background, right? Do, do you have any sort of technical background? Yeah, I mean... I think my I had my first computer was a Commodore VIC twenty back in probably nineteen eighty three or something like that. So uh, I learned basic then using a, there was a there was a magazine um, series that came out in the UK at the time. It was like a I think it was a monthly or a weekly magazine called Input. It was weekly. It had fifty two issues basically, and and by the time you got to the fifty second issue, you could pretty much program in basic. Um, and they had things that you know the actual programs that you could you could uh, enter into the computer and um, have games to play and all sorts of stuff. So that's that was my first um, first interest in in tech really. So that was probably nineteen eighty three. I was about twelve. Twelve. Or so. Okay. And then um, from then, I, I mean, at school I was always pretty maths and engine and physics and all that stuff was was my forte really, and. Um, and when I left, when I left school, I went to. Whoa, 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 whoa. slow down, slow down. Moving too fast, moving too fast. I, I want to talk about your. I mean, we call it high school here when you're like 15, 16, 14, 15, 16, 17. Like that, that's high school here. So I, I want to talk about that that age, that those last four years of grade school, because I think that's a shaping. That's a time where you're really trying to figure out what it is you kind of want to do. You know, it might not end there, but you start to think about it. So. What are you, what are, what are the main things you're doing 
around that age, 14 through 17. Are, what do you focus? I see a lot of um, guitars in the background. So yeah. I, I imagine music had to be a big part. When did the music part of your life start? Around the same time? Music part started when I was about six or seven. And I started uh, piano lessons, and then I took up the violin when I was eight. And I played the violin pretty much until I was 19 or so, and through all the grades in violin. And at the same time, started singing. Um, sort of a, my dad was a, was a fantastic singer, and he sang in a lot of choirs, and that sort of inspired me a lot. So I sang in, I sang in some choirs locally. We did a lot of that in school as well. So I was always in and around the music side of things at school. But um, academically, I was very much in the sort of the maths and science side of things. So um, you have to remember when I went when I was at school. This was in Northern Ireland in the in the eighties. So it was sort of a it was an interesting place to be, put it mildly. So it was you know there was a lot going on there. Um, so basically, you know there wasn't much to do outside of school and your hobbies. You know there wasn't. Uh, it's a completely different place now, obviously, but then it was um, quite militarized, and uh, you know, there was a lot of you know, there wasn't much, there wasn't many facilities for people to do. So music was definitely one outlet, one outlet, and I uh, ended up in an orchestra, and it helped me meet all the people around Northern Ireland that I wouldn't have normally met because everyone was quite segregated there. And uh, yeah, so music was a big, definitely a big part of my, of my. Uh, my upbringing, I would say, with the with the violin, did you you was it all really classical, or did you learn how yeah. to play it in a more modern way, like you see today with uh, a lot of bands and? No, it was it was a hundred percent classical. You know, I didn't even attempt any traditional Irish music, which is horrible. It's horrible to think about it now. <laughs> but um, it was definitely a labor of love. The violin, you know, I I, I did it as a. You know, I, I, did, I do enjoy music. I prefer singing and I prefer the whole choral side of things. I enjoyed the violin. It got me, opened a lot of doors for me socially, if you know what I mean. I, um, I often tell people, you know, I, I went to an old boys grammar school in, in Derry in Northern Ireland. And um, uh, it was like a, a Catholic grammar school. And I think if it wasn't for the violin, I wouldn't have met a, a woman or a Protestant until, until I was <laughs> like 20. <laughs> so, um... So it definitely gave me a, a wider view of the world. So it allowed you to get into a into social situations that were a little bit more diverse that you exactly. otherwise wouldn't have had access to. And exactly. that's because everybody was kind of coming together in the music schools or they were coming together at concerts. Yeah, I mean, the local sort of education authority had a, would bring, you know, people who played instruments would, would gather in one place and they would have an orchestra, like a full sort of symphony orchestra that you would, you would go to rehearsals every, once a week and then they would do concerts around, in and around Northern Ireland and we would also go to places like Scotland or wherever and do um, like week-long summer camp type things and play in Edinburgh and, and you know, do, do things like that. So it was a really, you know, for, for someone in my situation in Derry at the time, that was, you know, this, this was uh, quite an exotic uh, thing to be doing really, to get, you know, to get away from things and um, really just escape into that world. That's super interesting, right? Because sports is, is a good outlet for that as well. But was there, was, was the sports that prevalent against, I don't know how it would work, especially at that time with everything that was going on. There was plenty of sport going on as well. I mean, there was definitely, you had sort of football, you know, soccer is a big thing in, in, at home. And also then on, with my sort of background, there was quite a lot of sort of Gaelic football and hurling going on. I mean, more Gaelic football in Derry, actually. There's not a massive amount of hurling there um, when I was growing up. Um, but yeah, sport was also a, a bit of a time that you could actually escape. So sport and music were the two things that young people could do, you know, and it didn't take much to do it. There wasn't, it was quite a deprived area at the time. You know, there wasn't much investment in, in, the, in the whole area. So, you know, you try and find things to do that were didn't cost too much, but could enrich your life quite a bit. The violin had to cost a little bit. I mean, did you have that same violin from the time you were, I don't know, 12 to 19? I mean, that's an investment, isn't it? Yeah, actually, you know what? I didn't own the violin. So the, the local education authority provided instruments for everyone. Who you know, At the age of, I think I remember at primary school, which was like, I was what, seven or eight. 
been pulled out of the class, going going to this room somewhere, and you had a, someone played a scale on the piano, and you had a you had to sing it, <laughs> and they went, okay, you, you can you can play the violin. Here's a violin. Take it home, <laughs> and that and that's where it started. So people, like most of my peers, all my my best friends who, who I'm obviously still in touch with, or whatever, they all were instrumentalists of some description, and that's basically. Very few of us chose the instrument. You know, it was handed to you <laughs> when you were about seven or eight. <laughs> really? Yeah. So depending on what they, they, man, like just made your bias and whatever they thought they saw or heard or your hand size or something, and then they went, here. That type of thing. I suppose when you're seven or eight, you know, I think brass instruments are still a bit, a bit out of reach at that stage. Violins were, you know, you can, if reasonably accessible and... Uh, Come on a nice size, so yeah. Were you excited about the violin? I, what happens if you say, no, I don't want a violin, I want, I don't know. Well, yeah, well, I don't know. I was quite a compliant kid, so I just uh, went along with it. At the time, it was exciting. You know, this, if you, you know, if you ever held a violin or, or opened a violin case, you know, there's a smell, there's a, there, that sort of, well, There's an elegance to it. Yeah. Yeah, there's an elegance to it. There's not much elegance to playing it when you're seven or eight. I'll have to say that. You know, my parents had to put up with, <laughs> had to put up with quite a quite a racket, I would say. But, you know, you persevere and eventually you start making some sort of noise that's worth listening to. Did you take to it? Did it, you know, like, there are these moments, like, when I'm, like, I, I think with programming, I, I have it, where I just get it. Like, it's in my head. I don't have to think about it. My dad, he's a musician. He could hear something and just play it. Like the saxophone was in his head. And I've seen piano players like that too. At some point, I guess the violin just got in your head. Like you just knew it. You didn't even have to think about it, right? Yeah, I mean, to me, I wasn't, wouldn't say I was a natural. Like, you know, it definitely, I didn't enjoy practicing at all, you know. I enjoyed it to an extent. And I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever class myself as a performer, funnily enough. So, you know, I like even all this stuff behind, you know, this is, uh, for my personal sort of enjoyment, I, mean, I do record stuff and whatever, but I, to actually go on stage and perform so uh, on an individual basis terrifies me. Um, but yeah, no, the violin was, it definitely was a, it was a great, I think it really opened my eyes to a lot of things, you know, in terms of different type, genres of music. And, you know, I learned a lot from that. And I think, you know, with music and, and maths, there's so many, overlaps and patterns and things. So I know I enjoyed that side of things as well. I think that was, I just had an affinity for it. So what are you thinking as you're finishing, we'll just call it grade school. You're 16, you're 17, you're finishing grade school. You're still playing the violin. Music's still a big part of that. What are you thinking as Next Step University? Are you thinking I'm gonna continue with music? Are you thinking because you liked math and the science that you're gonna kind of have an opportunity to change gears? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was going to be engineering, really. Is what I wanted to do something technical. Um, so this was, this was about 1989, around that time. And again, but it's, all this is a bit informed by my the situation and, how, and where I grew up and everything. You know, like at the time, I'd say there's maybe two, maybe 180, 200 other students of my age in my school. And you know the vast majority of them are are leaving Northern Ireland to go somewhere else to to pursue their education. And a lot of them have never come, never gone home again. Um, you know, so there's a certain amount of leaving the situation and trying to be somewhere a bit less, uh, you know, a bit less spicy, so shall we say? Um, but academically, like I say, I was sort of maths and physics were my thing, so. The school at the time, the career service was very much, you know, you, it was literally like the world was made up of about five jobs. You know, you were like engineering, law, medicine, you know, <laughs> teaching. That was sort of the, they weren't, we weren't presented with a raft of uh, routes, if you know what I mean. So, um, you know, based on me messing about with computers for that, that, that amount of time, for probably about five or six years at that stage, then... Uh, I fancied doing some engineering and doing some software engineering. So I ended up going to um, London and studying like information systems engineering. All right, so wait, wait, before we do anything with that, let's just, let's just do one thing because 
there's a lot of young people who will be listening to this and like just 30 seconds, right? Like in Northern Ireland at that time, there was almost a war going on in the streets between the Catholics and the Protestants over a lot of political, political stuff. I know from the US we saw, you know, you gotta take the news with a bit of a grain of salt, right? Because if you're listening to that news from the US, I mean, literally it was a, it was a war zone. I'm sure it wasn't like that every day, but for people to understand it was, it was pretty bad at that time in, in the city, right? I mean, it was dangerous, it was dangerous. So just, just to give, because we're saying spicy and we're saying words, we're trying to be polite, yeah. but people <laughs> need to understand that that was a time where, where there was some real violence going on between Catholics and Protestants over political stuff. Definitely, I mean, you, yeah. Yeah, just, just to, so people understand. Okay, so you wanna go into engineering and you're gonna go to London. W what kind of engineering were you doing prior to making that decision? Were you right, I know you said you were doing some basic at 12. Were you still writing software? Were you building websites? Well, it's 89, so we didn't have that kind of stuff yet. Yeah, you and I are about the same age, so. <laughs> I mean, like Michael, kinda, what to, were you doing? To give you an example, my computer science, um, we did a bit of computer science at school. Like, but there was literally one, there was one computer in the school. It was a, it was a BBC micro thing. But um, I, I still remember, you know, my computer science um, teacher was, <laughs> he basically had like a, a, a piece of paper with a, with a, a keyboard sort of drawn on it. <laughs> and wow. I, I, some of my computer science lessons were literally learning how to type on a paper keyboard. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, so that, that was all sort of, you know, actual, um, you know, the actual reality of engineering or what it meant or even, even what programming meant in reality, you know, apart from, you know, basic to me and the, that stuff I was doing with the VIC-20, it was all game-based or whatever, but, you know, the actual reality of what I would be doing, I had no idea. Thinking back, I had no idea. I just, you know, knew that it was something, I think, it's the way the world was going and it was something I would, I thought, well, this is uh, something I should get should get involved in. And then, what universities did you end up? You ended up going to London. Yeah. Was that the only school you kind of applied to? Were there other options? Yeah, there basically. For you? I mean, the the biggest thing for me at the time was to you know leave Northern Ireland, and you know, London was pretty much where I wanted to be. Um, so yeah. I, I, at the time you had to put maybe you had to apply to five different the system here you have to apply put five universities on a list and uh you know they all will either give you an offer or not and then you decide which one you want to you want to go for so i think i think pretty much i had um yeah it was all it was all engineering based or computer science based all my all the courses that i applied to and um i applied to computer science course in at Imperial in London, and um, at the time they got back in touch and said, right, "We have we have a new course that we're we're forming now, because you know, based which is called Information Systems Engineering." So they, they described it as the the hard end of software and the soft end of hardware. So it was sort of <laughs> sat right right in between, you know. So half my half my time was spent in computer science, half my time was spent in electronic engineering. Um, oh. so it was, you know, so it was sat, sat there basically. So that this new course, they said this is a brand completely new course. They hadn't thought it before at Imperial. So they, and, um, they said, do you fancy doing it? And I said, okay, sounds, that sounds cool. Again, without really understanding what I was getting myself into, to be honest. <laughs> now, let me ask you this because London's expensive, right? I mean, did you have, you had to, in, I imagine you, you had to pay for that university. And you had to pay for a place to live, or the university was. No, this is back in the, the you know this is back in the halcyon days where the government here paid for your, paid for everything, so um, you know your tuition fees were paid for. You got a grant from the government that covered your sort of living costs and things. You know, you know I didn't I didn't I really when I think back now it's amazing. I mean me me now I don't think could have could do it. Or not necessarily. We probably could still do it, but maybe would be coming out saddled with all sorts of all sorts of debt. But uh, yeah, it, it would be expensive if you paid for it. But the government here paid for everything. So um, 
Yeah, and then you didn't exactly. really have to worry about a job either then at that point. You had a you no, had your exactly. grant. Full full time you could just work you could just you know, go to uni and um your accommodation was paid for. Initially it was you were in like an inter, I was in like an intercollegiate hall in London in uh just off Top of Court Road, like in the cent right in the centre of London. And uh for someone from like me from Derry, which is like a hundred thousand people where literally everyone knows you, to go to London where no one knows you was just the most mind blowing thing I think I can <laughs> I can't explain how, how, you know, life changing that was for me. The novelty of it too, right? The novelty yeah, of being there at the time. I, had, I mean, I hadn't really, at that stage, I think when I, when I actually came to London, I think I'd been outside of Ireland twice in my life. I, I once to London for like two days with a friend who had come for an interview for, an, for a university. And then one other time I went to France with my primary school when I was like 11. So this was like a whole, whole change of scene, you know, like this, the, the, just absolutely mind blowing, really. Um, and I told my mom, like apparently the first thing I told my mom when I rang home, on the, as as soon as I got to London, was oh this place is amazing. Nobody knows me here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could get in trouble and nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows, yeah, yeah, because. At the time, I remember at the time in, in Derry, like I could be walking down the main road in Derry, which is maybe three, two and a half miles from my house. And at one time I was walking down the main road with, with a girl. And um, by the time I got home, my mom asked her, who was this, who was this, uh, who were you walking down? <laughs> I, <laughs> and it, like, this is before, this wasn't being WhatsApp to or anything, you know, somehow this was like a pure, someone's, somehow she's, she's been told this. <laughs> The, the jungle drums were, were, were flying there. So, um, yeah, you can. Yeah, but, you, didn't... you know, look back on that today and how amazing was that, in all honesty, right, with a community that really, right, looked out. You know, we've lost it, right? We've to totally lost it. I could tell my kids, you know, a typical day for me back then was, you know, everyone our age probably is, you, you never were inside that. You were never at home. And your parents didn't know where you were half the time. You just you know, you had one row, and that was be home in time for be home at dinner time, and that was it. That was literally it, um, you know. So and you could you could literally be anywhere within maybe a four or five mile radius of the house, and no one really cared. <laughs> so. Um, well, what you always had eyes on you, no matter what you had eyes yeah, on. Yeah, there was you. always somebody who knew who you were, or knew whose son you were, or you know knew who you were with. And now you're in London, and you're basically really almost undercover. Like, it doesn't matter what you do. Nobody's going to know about it. Nobody can even take pictures yet. We're only talking 1989. <laughs> exactly. 1989, yeah. I know. Exactly. I came, I came to London with one of, my, one of my best friends from school as well. He, he went to, um, he was one of them, he went and studied music at King's. So we, were, we sort of came over together. We were in the same hall. So we had a, a bit of a, you know, there was a few dairy boys in, in Derry, in, in London at the time. But yeah, apart from that, it was, you know, it was a whole new thing. You're just an anonymous person. And obviously in London at the time as well, with my accent and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily, oh, you know, the most welcoming place at times, but it was, at the same time, there was a, it was big enough that you could, you could have a, you could really have a good, you know, you could really enjoy your time. So, you're, so you're learning a mix of hardware and software and data information, and you do this, you're doing this for four years, and you're, and you're getting this. I imagine as you're finishing university, you're thinking about a job in the engineering field at that point. You're looking for work. What's, what's happening? You know, self help. <laughs> this, is, this is where me and engineering then diversified. You know, our, our paths went a little bit... Uh, went a little bit askew because um, the whole time I was at university, like in the, in the middle of it, like the middle of the time I, um, of my first degree, my dad died suddenly and I got out of nowhere. So that sort of disrupted me for about a year. I could, you know, I had to go, I went back home and I just, anyway, it's, it made me sort of, um, it had a big impact on me. And then when I went back to finish the degree, um, at that stage I realized, you know, I don't think I'm an engineer. <laughs> it 
it took it took doing a degree for me to understand that I don't think this is necessarily what I want to do, and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. You know, I, th- I sort of had a I had a, I suppose some sort of bizarre naive confidence that no matter what I could, would do, I would be okay. But I just um, I don't know. There was something about the finishing aspect of engineering that I wasn't. I'm not a finish. You know, I'm not really a finisher at that time in my life. I wasn't. You know, I like creating and I liked maybe solving but don't ask me to get to the end of the you know thing and actually produce anything <laughs> you know <I> could, <laughs> you know that that would be that that would you know and that made me think well I don't know if I have if I have what it takes to, to do this you know even though I enjoyed I enjoyed the learning and everything it wasn't I just thought this isn't really the job that I'm going to end up in but you finished that degree right you, yeah, you, yeah. You, so I had two kids out of the five, two of them had the same experience. In their last year of university, they said, this is not what I want to be doing. I convinced them to finish the degree, <laughs> and then we'll decide what you're going to do next, right? And each of yeah. them wanting to take a year off after that to kind of just reset. One, one is going to graduate school, the other one's finishing now and wants that year, right? So. Once you finish that degree, do you do you do that kind of same thing? You just say, "I'm going to take a year off and figure out what I want to do next." In in a way, it's funny because um, I decided. I mean, stay in stay in education really is what I, you know. But for me, the biggest thing was stay in London. That was what I wanted. I knew I wanted to stay in London. I didn't really want to go back home, so I wanted to stay in London. And um, and this is where sort of the music side came back in then because then I thought, well, music technology was something I was, again, sort of had some sort of interest in or I wanted to explore that a bit more. So, you know, take a bit of what, what I did at, at, in my first degree and, and I ended up doing a postgrad in music technology at City University in London. So what is that degree about? Was it about learning how to work with the equipment? Uh, like what is that music technology degree? It was ba- at the time. It was basically learning about synthesis and you know um, how how analog synthesizers work. Um, it was a bit about there was some very basic um, sort of production side. Of it. it wasn't like a sound engineering type degree. It was more. Of, it was basically more about um, music, you know, synthesizers and electronics of synthesizer. You know, more the the basics of it really. And um, a bit about production in terms of like whatever DAW we had at the time. I can't remember the name of it now, but things like Cubase, that type of that type of work. We're talking like ninety three, right? Ninety three. Yeah, exactly. Nin- Nineteen ninety three. Yeah. And but the, the big thing, I mean, my my first degree was fairly intense. You know, this was like a, it was full on. You know, and um, this music technology course was literally eight hours a week or something. It was. Like it was crazily like lax compared to my first with the previous three years I've been doing maybe like thirty five hour weeks, uh, you know, in lectures or whatever. So, for me, the the music technology was like a it was like a year off, but without having to you know. Oh, but you got to have a job, right? I mean, that wasn't free no, still, with grant money. No, right? was, this was still this was still this was still free. Yeah, I was like, oh, you know, I was benefiting greatly from the. <laughs> Wow. From the system at the time, it was amazing. And you had your grant money so you could still live. So what were you, okay, if that's eight hours a week, dude, what are you doing for the rest of the uh, week, right? you no, got to be doing something. <laughs> I'm trying to remember now, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> the pub, I was in the pub. Oh, yeah, that, that, I, I, you know, yeah, the pub did feature a lot, you know. I remember, were I remember you playing your instruments? Were you playing I your was instruments playing, at least? I was playing, you know, I even went busking a few times around Liverpool Street Station. And uh, that was an experience that definitely got me realizing, you know, I'm still definitely not really a performer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were out uh, there with the case on the floor? I was, out, yeah, I had a, a, one of my, a mate, a guy I met on the music technology course. He, he, um, he was, a, he was a, a violinist, like a fantastic violinist actually. And I had the guitar at this stage. I taught myself guitar and whatever. And uh, we went around Liverpool Street and which was not far from where uni was and just, we bust there a few times. Is there a translation between the violin and the guitar? Was it something that you can map in your head, or you really had to learn a new? Or was it like learning a new instrument. The similarity. Well, the thing is, you know, if you play the violin, 
you've gone through the pain on your fingertips already, you know, so maybe you don't feel it as much when you're learning guitar. You know, people who learn the guitar from scratch obviously end up going through all sorts of layers of skin. Um, I mean, the, the, the intervals between strings are different. It's just sort of a different, it's a whole different scale as well, obviously. The violin's very tight. I think once you have some sort of grounding in music, playing, you know, mastering the guitar, learning the guitar, it makes, it's not a massive leap, to be honest. You've got the theory, you just, you know, you can learn, you can work out the chords and whatever else pretty easily after that. Why the guitar? Why not stick with the violin? Just because your buddy was a, such a good violinist, you're like, we're going to have to accompany you? Yeah, well, the, the guitar started coming into my being when I was about 16 or so, 15 or 16. You know, you could just, you know, the violin was, as I said before, it was very, all everything I did was classical. You know, it's not, it's not something you whip out at a party and, um, you know, people don't really want to hear. <laughs> I got to take you down here in Miami, dude, because all the Latin music down here now is all violin. It's oh, all. Wow. Okay. It's amazing. I'll go into a restaurant and it could just be a violinist right, with a little right. Latin music behind them. And I don't know. It's pretty amazing um, what I'm seeing today with that. All right, so you're finishing that next year of, of um, music tech. You're, you're, you're getting that degree. You haven't been working because you've got the grant money. You want to stay in London. School's now about to end. Yep. So what's your next move? Next move is try and find a job. <laughs> and uh, to be, like I say, London was, a, for me, staying in London was a priority. You know, not knowing I didn't want to do engineering and music technology was more of a thing that I knew I was going to do in my spare time. I didn't really, wasn't going to pursue it as a job. So... I thought, well, let's see what we can do. I, I discovered as a bit more of a, not necessarily as introverted as I thought I was at university, you know, when, before I went to university. So I thought, let's try and do something a bit more people oriented. And uh, there are plenty of sales jobs in London. And uh, I mean, use, most sales companies will hire anyone to start with and give them a go and see what happens. So I started, I <clears throat> went to a few interviews for sales roles. Like this is literally back in advertising sales days. Horrible out of my comfort zone situations they were. Never and, and at one of the interviews I met someone who who told me that he'd been to an interview for a recruitment company and uh, I'd never even I'd never really that recruitment had never crossed my mind. I didn't even know it existed really as a job. You know, for me a job was you see an advert, you apply to it and you get the job or, or you don't get the job. So he explained to me at this interview, this chap I met, um, you know, this is recruitment and this is what you do, and um, and then you get paid for how good you are. Basically, it's that that you know that was my takeaway from that. And I was thinking, oh, no, as I said, I had sort of an innate confidence in what I could do as a person. So I thought I might give this recruitment thing a go and see it. I got very naively, no idea. So I asked him where he'd interviewed, and he told me. So I basically left that interview, which was around in Leicester Square somewhere, and I walked up. Charing Cross Road, I walked up Tottenham Court Road and I knocked on the door of the recruitment company that was that he had interviewed at. And uh, they let me in and I sat down with their, um, one of the, there was two guys running the company and I sat down with one of them and I don't know, two days later I was working there. <laughs> wow. So this is like 94 then? It said to be around 94. October 94, yeah. So you thought, I mean, they must have told you you're going to have to go and research, find people, talk to people, convince them that you have the right jobs. Like, what, what were they telling you at the time was? Yeah, basically, I mean, it's probably nothing much changed probably about recruitment, to be honest, in terms of how it's sold as a job, I would say. But, you know, they tend to lead a lot on, you know, money. That's, that's, which is probably one of the issues with recruitment as an industry, to be honest, because it attracts, attracts people who are in it for the wrong reasons or, you know, or have been missold what being successful in recruitment looks like. Um, but basically they were, you know, they, were, they told me, you know, you're gonna be, the, the role is you have companies who are looking for people and you go and look for them. And we're, we're a search firm, we don't, you know, so you have to do a lot of research. And you know, this is back, they didn't even have a computer in their office. I mean, that, the research was, I remember literally going to the library a couple of times, <laughs> looking, you know, looking for directories. So, but, they, but again, the thing that stuck with me was that if I'm any way good at this, then 
I think I could be, I could really set myself up in London and I could be, you know, I could make something of myself. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I, even though it was a bit scary and that it was very much commission based, you know, very low basic salary. I thought, well, if I'm anyway good, I'll be, I'll be, you know, London's expensive. This, this could be a good way of doing something rather than starting out of graduate roles elsewhere and maybe struggling for five years in something I don't like to see what I can do with this. And this is 94, right? So this is really like no internet. I'm trying to remember. It wasn't found, no internet. <laughs> no, I found the recruiter that I, again, who I loved and, and, and I can still talk to today from the newspaper. I think I opened up a help wanted, help wanted something and found this person and, and I thought, whoa, I mean, they must know where all the jobs are. This is going to make my life easier, right? Yeah, yeah. So how are people, how are you finding people or how are people finding you? I was, so this company that I worked at, they were, they, we were sort of specialized in investment banking. Now, to be honest, when I say specialized in investment banking, that, it became clear to me later in life that, you know, they, they didn't really understand investment banking. They didn't understand you know, but they come from a, they had done some IT recruitment in the past and now they've sort of moved into, a, were ended up, you know, with the sort of, um, you know, when things got deregulated in London and, and IT jobs became much more a thing in the banks, you know, that they ended up trying to find people who worked in, like, people like RPG programmers, AS400 guys, that type of thing, you know, and, um, and then we ended up, they ended up sort of migrating to look at for traders and quant analysts and, risk people that type of thing so so i ended up after probably six months of struggles i ended up saying i wanted i wanted to focus on quant analysts so because i have felt an affinity anyway because i obviously i had the maths background and these were all mathematicians and physicists so i felt like i was going to be talking to people who were like me which i think is important if you're in recruitment so so they let me do that so i, I just started researching every bank in london and trying to find who worked where in, in you know in this area and there were some some directories that you could get hold of that you know there has there was some like I remember some book was about death book thick I think it was published by BNP Paribas or something it was it was def, I can't remember the name of it now but it was Euro Money it was uh, Euro Money had published this directory of the, like a who's who in banking um, really yeah and you would have like a a company and and then you would have lists of different departments they'd name the the head of the department in some cases they would give you know some banks would give every name going and other banks would give very little so um the way I f we didn't advertise anyway i didn't use any job any newspapers or anything it was literally proper head hunting and networking and talking to people and trying to get referrals to other people and sometimes a candidate might actually give you the, their their banks directory of everyone you know that was <laughs> it was mad but i just focused on those guys they were quite technical obviously they were you know developing models to price derivative products and um they all seemed to have a similar background to me but you were going to the banks and trying to catch them walking out a door or? no it literally phone you would literally you would literally phone the bank i still and remember for this like, person <laughs> you ask for yeah exactly you would you would literally phone the bank the main switchboard like i can still i probably still know the, the, off by heart the numbers of about 30 or 40 investment banks in london in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> that's how many times i dialed those numbers and you were asked to be put through to xyz and you would just get put through no, no screening or anything and then if the person you were looking for didn't answer the phone and they put you through to his extension say or her extension they didn't answer the phone. The first thing you would ask them was, oh, who am I speak? Who, who are you? I'm looking for such and such. Or he's not, oh, who are you? And they would tell you their name. So then that's another name. You know that he works with, or they work with the other person. So that's, you know, you would sort of grow by, organically it would grow, <laughs> the people you would know. And everybody was open to talking to you at the time? Like, I guess no. people didn't, no, okay. <laughs> it depends, it all depended. You know, when I think about it now, it, it, now that way of working just wouldn't fly at all. But you would call someone at their office, literally, and they you know, and they would answer the phone, and you could have, you would have maybe, uh, you'd have five minutes, maybe, if you were lucky, to to persuade someone that it was worthwhile having a chat later in the evening, 
you know, so they would give you their home phone number. But you're playing this off as a long-term game, right? You're not saying, I want to steal you from bank A to go to bank B, I imagine. Yeah, no, right? we, no, we weren't. I was literally, I would have a, like a, let's say I had a job as a, I don't know, in JP Morgan, and I would be calling people in other banks and saying, I've got this job at blah, 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 and giving them the, the, the positives and, you know, the reasons why it would be interesting. What do you think? Are you interested? And a lot of the times, you know, it, it, it became, if you do the job right, it doesn't become about that job that you're pitching necessarily, but you need something that makes people interested in the first place. So, and if they were interested, then you would, you would basically get their, their home phone number and, and arrange a time that you would call them in the evening. So you were calling people then after work hours. How long were you with this, this first company during, during the recruiting? I was at that company. So I joined them in, in 1994. And when I finally left, it was 2003. Oh, so you were there it's like nine, nine years. Yeah, um, I was like the fourth employee of that company. And when I left, there was like 100, maybe 150, 170 people or so. All right, so a couple of questions there. You must have really enjoyed this. I'm guessing you really enjoyed it. It wasn't really just, I mean, nine <laughs> years. And, and you were at the same company for nine years, which is a long time, right? Yeah. So one, was it, were you really enjoying the work? And then what made you finally decide that it was time to, to move on? You know, to say that I enjoyed it, there's a, you know, I don't know, I've, I had this, I don't know if it's my background or whatever, but enjoying my work wasn't necessarily a big thing for me. I didn't think anyone enjoyed the work. <laughs> it was, uh, you were, <laughs> you were working. You know, it was, you didn't have the luxury of enjoying your work at the time. I don't think my dad ever enjoyed his work. You know, like uh, that's part of. <laughs> okay. Um, but I felt I was. I knew I, I felt I, I could do something with this, you know, and I, I, even though the nine years I was at that company, things changed in my time there. And um, I, t I grew that from that quant analyst specialism, then, you know, I would never, I'd never class myself as a, as a typical recruiter, like all the people who were hired, I would say are very typical sales oriented people. You know, at the time, recruiters were usually people who had been selling photocopiers maybe the year before, you know, that was that type of person. And I never felt like an affinity in that way, but I felt an affinity to the people I was talking to in the candidate world, you know, and the clients. So, I, you know, I could, I could have a, I really enjoyed my conversations with people and I liked understanding what they were doing and actually taking an interest in what they were doing and trying to un understand it as much as I could. And then from talking to those people, I, I realized that, you know, a lot of these guys in the banks at the time were PhD physicists or, you know, who'd somehow stumbled across the fact that they could work in a bank you know, it wasn't necessarily that clear to them. So then I realized, I thought, well, the universities, I remember my time at university, the career service at the university was all around the graduates, you know, the, the people who have finished their first degrees, postgrads at the time, PhDs and master students weren't really thought of in the same way. So they didn't have to have the same advice and even graduate recruitment in, in the big companies at the time was based around graduates. There was nothing really around people with, with uh, higher degrees. So I thought, well, I think there's maybe a, a service here that I could bring into the world, which is helping postgrads, like say PhD level people, find a niche outside of academia. You know, find out where else they could use their skills outside of academia. Um, so I'd, so within the company that I, because I was number four in the company, I had a certain amount of you know respect in the company, and they like they, you know they listened to me and whatever, and I, I pitched this idea that. This is around 98 then. I pitched this, um, the dot com was just kicking off and I pitched this idea, let's, let's set up a website and let's call it phdjobs.com and around the website we'll have, um, I'll, build a, I'll build a recruitment team of specialists who will look at different industries, not just banking anymore, so look in biotech and look in electronic industry and whatever and we will actively hunt in the universities and we'll talk to postgrads in the universities and we'll open their eyes to you know okay you're doing a you're doing a degree you're doing a PhD in physics but did you know you could actually find a job in A, B, C, D and E industry for example and we'll put you in touch with these companies so that's that's what I started basically in 98 was a subsidiary of the company that I joined we call it 
ECI Postgraduate Career Service, because the company was called ECI, and the, we had a website, phdjobs.com. It's a brilliant idea, actually, because you notice that there was an entire workforce that didn't realize that there was opportunity somewhere. And you yeah. were, and I imagine the opportunities you were giving them were, were even better financially for them, right? I, I mean, you get somebody in a bank, the salaries had to be better than... Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and, I, and I would coach them in a way, you know, so at the time, if you wanted to get a job as a quant in the, in the, in the, in the city of London, there was a book um, by, I think it's called Black, Black and Shoals, which was about pricing derivatives. And if you read this book, you could be, and you understood it, you could basically ace every junior quant analyst interview in London. You know, even just having read the book would would automatically get almost get you the job. You know, so if you're <laughs> wow. if you're a physicist and you know, and they ask you, you know, what do you know about derivatives? And you say, well, I've read Black and Shoals. It became a thing. If you haven't read it, you weren't getting the job. If you read it, there's a really good chance you were going to get it. So, so part of what I was doing was 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 trying to be the bridge between these guys in academia and the industry and telling them, look, you need to learn this, you need to know that, you need to be able to basically price an option before you go, before you go into the interview, because they'll ask, you, know, you will get asked that, and you need to upskill from, from Fortran 77, which you've been using all your life, and start teach yourself C++. That, so, so I was basically giving the banks and uh, people that they could actually run with much quicker in the on the banking side of things and we were doing similar things in other in other industries to be honest but um it's really brilliant right i mean it's really brilliant you brought two 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 people and companies together that wouldn't have otherwise found each other and you were really feeling needs on both like it's beautiful actually yeah no i, I was very proud of that <laughs> no I, I i think it's brilliant i mean that's really helping people on both sides of that coin hmm. What happens in 2003, though? You decide it's time to go on your own at this point? Yeah, basically. I thought, you know, I've, I've been there and done it now. And uh, the company I was in, this, it had grown. It was very heavily sort of, um, apart from my section, there was, uh, it was quite still heavily involved in the banks, still heavily involved, doing a lot, quite a lot in telco as well. And post 9-11, you know, it got into a, a lot of places start, stopped hiring. It was a really tricky time, if you remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everything stopped. Budget stopped because nobody knew what was going to happen. And so you weren't spending money unless you had to. Yeah. And the thing I was doing was, you know, it, it wasn't the main part of the business. You know, if, it, it, and I, f I really felt that, you know, as budget started getting cut, then I felt I was, it, wasn't just, you know, it wasn't going in the direction I wanted to go in. So I, I made the decision to, you know, I'm going to stop. You know, I've given it nine years. I'm going to stop and I'll, I'll regroup and see what I want to do. But I knew, by then I knew I was going to obviously stay in recruitment, but I didn't know what I was going to do, to be honest. Um, so even though PhD Jobs was my sort of baby, I had to sort of leave it in care. So, um, you know, in fact, PhDjobs.com is still going, actually. It's like, a, it's... Um, I think it's been bought by an American company now. It seems to be mainly academic jobs, so it's sort of veered away from from my original plan. So you leave in 2003 without another job? You just, yeah. you're, you have enough income to now say, well, you, ha you saved enough to say, let me see what we're going to do for the next year. And you knew it's recruitment, but you're not sure. Yeah. So then what happens in 2003, 2000, like when do you start up again? I, st I start up, I, I get myself with three or four months off i was just thinking of formulating ideas and at that time that i met my my wife it was basically was thinking of it, about let's maybe do something together in recruitment was she in recruitment already as yeah, well yeah she was okay yeah. so so we decided to okay let's let's do something together because i mean recruitment is you know working in an agency there are certain pressures that are put on you as a recruiter that actually are not necessarily conducive to you being a good recruiter. So when you work for yourself, you can cut all that stuff out and you know you're, you're working on stuff that's actually, you know, you want to do and it makes sense and it's... So we decided that's what we're going to do. So I stayed in the... I went back to the 
to focus in on the quant side of things. So 2003, and she she started looking at pharmaceuticals and particularly regulatory affairs in pharmaceuticals. And we we set up like a just a very niche business where it's up just about headhunting really. You know, we worked a lot of retained. I had a few client banks that I would work with and found decent quants for. Like experience I was going to ask people. you that because I imagine you signed things that says that said that you couldn't go. Like you basically had to start over, right? And a lot of the banks yeah, yeah. you were working with should have been, or I would have imagined was untouchable because your last company, right? Yeah, so yeah. how do you do that? How do you get in and say, no, deal with me now? Yeah, well, in the in the UK, that sort of, I mean, those types of agreements, I didn't have it like anything written down on that front, to be honest, and we, they weren't really enforcing that. I left in a, the company I left as well was on a certain trajectory that it wasn't, that was the least of their worries was someone like me on my own going in and talking to anyone, you know, they, they didn't really care, to be honest. So they were happy for me to talk to whoever. Um, so I had a few a few clients that I, that I would would talk to and they, they decided to keep using me. But for more, this was for more senior positions and I didn't have, I didn't have the engine that the, the website, the PhD Jobs was, was producing candidates on its own at, at one stage, you know, when, before the time I'd left. So, I just focused on senior level um, positions and pure headhunting and you know retained headhunt, not success only business, but just retained. But you had the relationships already. I mean, you were established, people knew you. You could exactly, make a yeah. phone call, right? And people would take it. So, I mean, that was great. Exactly, and at this stage, you know, email had finally entered the world of recruitment. <laughs> So, you know, it, it was easier to keep in touch with people, definitely. And, you know, and, and my wife, Nuri, she, she basically focused on pharmaceuticals and reg affairs and, and built, started building a business and the main customers were in Switzerland. So we were across, we were pretty much working across Europe. You know, she was heading across Europe and I was still very much focused in the city and London and pretty much all my candidates were coming from in and around there as well. And that's, that was the next journey then. So we had, we worked work together like we were busy together twenty four seven from then. <laughs> You're working out of your uh, out of your flat. You're working. You, you got an office space. We had a we had a little office space somewhere, and uh, it was still it spoke at that stage. It was easier to work in an office, like a serviced office with a telephone. Yeah, uh, and the the, the lo your your home uh, internet wasn't really up, wasn't really cutting it, you know, so. Um, so it was much more it was much more straightforward just to have an office and a place to go and and a landline because even the cell phones were still still exactly. was, near still in their infancy weren't they <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah so that that's when we started doing that so again the, the the key for me the whole way through this is always you have to specialize you can't you can't be generalist and do something in a niche well and that um, you know, that's that's the way to do it. I think. From, from so, how do you transition from these PhD, PhD, sorry, jobs into banks into now, and uh, more of the traditional now software engineering companies? When does that transition happen? Yeah, so that happened. So we had our company going from two thousand three until we had our first child in two thousand nine. And so she could Nuri couldn't really work anymore, um, you know. So me on my own and going to that office every day wasn't you know it was no fun anymore. That wasn't really I wasn't really enjoying it. And at the time, I had a call from an old colleague from the previous company that I'd been at, who had he had also seen I mean, recruitment's always you know always regenerating the, the, the recruiters who are any good end up setting up their own companies and it becomes you know it goes on and on and on so he remembered me from from my time in the past and uh he liked what i'd done with the teams that I had built me on to me and whatever and he he um persuaded me to come and join his agency that he was building which was an it recruitment agency which, oh. um, and that it recruitment was always something i steered away from to be honest because that was the most cutthroat uh, of all the recruitment uh, sectors, you know. Um, so I was a bit wary about that, but I went, 
I went and joined there as a, as a manager and started managing their um, their Scandinavian and Middle Eastern teams. So you weren't doing the recruiting as much as you were doing the actual no, recruiting. I you wasn't. Were, but you were training then? You were training and you were getting yeah, people exactly. better? Okay. Managing people basically and getting them through. And obviously fitting into their way of working in this agency again, back into the agency thing again, which was uh, obviously I, I, I I'd grown up in that in that environment, so I knew the sort of things that would be expected. And, and, but I always try and focus more on the end result than the necessarily all the KPIs on the way there. So yeah, so started started there, and the role I, I initially I managed the Scandinavian a Scandinavian permanent recruitment team, and they were a proper generalist IT firm. There were no one was specialising in anything particular, and then from then I became. Like I ended up making a move. I'd always done permanent recruitment then. I'd never done any contract recruitment ever. And I ended up being asked to run a contracts team because they were having trouble on the contract side of the business. So I, so I, made, I thought, well, I've never done contracts. Let's see what it's like. It's the most scary part of recruitment for me. I, I, I never really liked the atmosphere in contract recruitment. It was this proper, you know, dog eat dog. It's a lot more work too. It's a lot more. It's a lot. It's a lot more. You know why I said more work? It's because I know on our end, it's like you constantly have to talk to the client and constantly make them happy. Yeah. It's you know what I'm saying. That, that's why I said it was more work in that day to day. Exactly, and it, yeah, and there's a there's a sort of a, a bizarre um, contradiction around contract recruitment because. Typically, people think of you know, and within recruitment terms, they think of contract recruiters as the most salesy recruiters you can possibly get. Yeah, but what they don't realize is in contract recruitment, it's more about relationship. It's more about the relationship than closing the sale. It's not about the sale. So you can end up with the people who are all about getting the sale, and they don't really want to know about the uh, keeping everyone happy <laughs> afterwards, and uh, it becomes a mess. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, contract recruitment is all about what happens after the person starts working, not not beforehand. Like that, the actually finding a contractor is easy. You know, it's not it's not that's an easy part of recruitment to be honest. Finding candidates in contract recruitment is is very easy. Finding clients is the hard harder part. You know, whereas in perm recruitment, finding candidates is really is the tricky part. Um, and there's always companies looking for permanent good permanent people. So um. So I so I started working in in this uh, in in this contract division, and it was all European based. So I was concentrating on Benelux region. So I had, I learned a lot there. I learned a lot about you know contracting in Europe and the, the sort of the legalities and the regulations and tax laws and blah 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 blah. And uh, eventually, I ended up running all the contracts um, division of that company. So covering all, all of Europe. So I, had, at the, at the, I think I had about 25, 30 recruiters. We had about 250, 300 contractors out, something like that. And that was across all sorts of industries, you know, tel mainly in telecom, telco and software development, mainly. Um, and that's where, you know, when did I join there? I joined there in 2010 and I left there in 2015. Wow. So in five years, you grew, I mean, you grew a, a large business in those five years. Yeah, yeah. I helped grow it. I mean, obviously it was there to start with, but I helped grow and stabilize it a bit and try to be bring a bit of a human side into it. Well, they must have been devastated when you say I'm leaving in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> I would I'm have been sure. devastated. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. Because it, it, it was like the contract stuff, for me, I, I find it like running a contracts business, I find it probably, it's probably the most stressed I've ever been in my life, like. There's always an issue somewhere with either someone getting paid or someone not getting paid or people being happy with the work or not happy with the work or, you know, we had one awful situation once where a, a contractor of ours, like downloaded the entire system of the client and took off basically. Oh my God. And, uh, you know, that was things, things I got, you know, you're not, I'm not really built to deal with that sort of stuff. <laughs> you know, that was, that was horrible. And just dealing with payments and ch oh, that was I found it really, really stressful. And by the end, I was like, no, you know what? This is uh, I, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do it. And by then, we'd had we've now our two kids down the line, and uh, things are a bit more. Nuri's able to work again as well. And I thought, you know what? Let's just 
I really feel like I can just 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 do this for myself. You know, I started going back on the back a little bit in the last I mean, six months or so at, at the firm I was at, um, going back and doing some recruitment actually, and and I really you know going back to it again and trying and just having the freedom to do it again. But it just made me think, oh, you know what, I can I can do this, and I can do it in IT recruitment as well because I know I know I felt like I knew IT, I understood what was going on, and uh, I know I know one end of a you know front end from back end and Java from JavaScript, <laughs> so. I thought, you know, I can. I think I can do something in IT, and I thought it's just the key you now is to find the niche. So you you jump. So you leave and start your company again in 2015 with your wife. Yeah. And 15. Like, so what's your niche going to be at that point? Are you still going to find it? I'm still looking for it. I'd, I had done a few airline placements, and I was aware of sort of functional programming and. I thought Erlang, you know, there's def my God, there's a demand for Erlang developers that you don't know, you know, but there are no Erlang developers anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that was that had an appeal, but I thought you know I'll, I'd, that would just scare me. So um, so I was looking for other, I was looking for other, just a niche. I wanted to find something and because because of my sort of feeling of recruitment as an industry and how you know I, I don't really want to be anywhere where all the recruiters are. You know, that's that was my feeling at the time. I want to be somewhere like on a little, you know, on the planet Mars. You know, I, I let me, if there was recruitment on Mars, I would have been there. So I wanted to find something that was not yet mainstream and was a far enough from the crowd that your standard recruiter wouldn't be in it, and the, and an agency wouldn't necessarily have it on its radar yet. So I was looking around for the next thing. I say I, 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 I brushed through Erlang, and then I discovered Go. How did you discover Go? Was it like the conference you discovered? Was it like, like I'm interested in what when that came up on your radar screen and when you thought this is this is a demand or was it you had a client that started asking for it? No, I I I, I was looking I was looking around and I, I, somebody I'd been who had no one who was doing airline started talking about Go and I thought, what's go, what is Go? And he, he told me a little bit about it. And I thought, okay, I'll have a look. And I'll just is this like 16, 2016? This is 20, then, no, 2015. This is, this is oh, still 15. Okay. Yeah, this is like um, September 2015, around that time. And I thought, okay, let's have a look and see. And I did a quick search and, you know, what is Go or Golang? You know, that was get my head around Go and Golang was interesting. You know, <laughs> um, and... Uh, I found a few potential candidates or people who'd had go in their CV or whatever, and I, I had a chat with them about it. And they were, they were, and the, the thing that struck me was that everyone I spoke to was absolutely 100% in love with it. You know, like, like they were so evangelical about it, <laughs> and that I thought, wow, this this is this is something, you know. But it was still not necessarily. It was still quite niche, I think. Um, so I thought, but well, this this is something, and I. I'm pretty sure I looked and I couldn't see anyone really advertising for any go jobs anywhere or I couldn't see it. So I knew it wasn't in the mainstream of recruitment. So then I uh, did a bit more digging and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, there was a company in Barcelona who were looking for go people. And I thought, right, and I spoke to them and I said, look, I'm thinking of specializing in this. And they said, well, you can help us if you want. So I start, that's what I started in earnest was midway through September 2015. So you were looking on... This is it, right? So you were looking kind of on job boards, and anytime you saw a company looking for Go, you were like, "Hey, I can help." Yeah, but they, there weren't even that many. I mean, I, there was only one I found to start with. And I thought well, this is enough for me to start with. And then, I mean, as you speak to candidates, and most of the candidates I was speaking to them were using Go in their spare time and not using it in their job, but wanting to use it in their job. You know, there were so many people that got. I thought this is definitely going to grow, and everyone I spoke to said this is going to grow. And then I, I stumbled across Doc Go conference um that was happening it was happening in paris in october 2015 and i thought you know i'm going to go to this conference i'm just going to go and see what's happening and that just blew me away then that was that's when i realized i thought this is this is where it's at for me and it's it's specialist and it's niche and it's deep enough in the tech that it'll be a while before any other recruiter gets here this is definitely and all the people i met were fantastic like everyone, and everyone was so friendly, which I wasn't expecting. <laughs> I thought I, thought I was, I was gonna, gonna get ask stoned. You that. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that because I know when we met, 
the first time somebody introduced us and told me kind of who you were. And I'm a pretty good read of character. And again, I've met a lot of recruiters who I don't want to even be in the same room with, right? But I got the sense that you weren't a regular recruiter. You were somebody who really cared. But it's got to be hard for you, especially early on in a conference, something like that. Like, how do you introduce yourself in a way that people will be receptive to talk? Because I have to imagine some people just like, leave me alone. I mean, to be honest, at, the, at those early conferences, I didn't, I didn't, I just talked to people who would talk to me. You know, I wasn't necessarily going up to being, hi, I'm Martin, I'm a recruiter and I'm here to change your life or I've got 100 jobs that you could, you know, it was literally, because I, I, you know, I go to the conferences and I go to the talks and I, you know, I, I absorb what's been, what's been said and some of it's completely over my head, but I think I have enough grounding to, you know, to be able to, to pick up a lot of it and, and understand why what they're saying is important or where it would be used or whatever. And then I can have, conversations with people about what we've just been listening to or you know and, and then ask them just ask I was mainly asking people you know what do you think of why are you here and what do you think of go and where is it going to where is it heading and and like I could say the enthusiasm of everyone was was what really st stuck with me I thought this you know it's almost like being at some beginning of some religion I think that's what I felt like it was everyone was so positive about it so um yeah so i don't if when i'm at conferences i don't really i think the last thing i want to talk to anyone about is a specific job or or their specific job or i just want people to get i just want to get to know people like as people and then get to know me as me and you know and then it'll come up eventually someone will ask me in the conversation so you know you, you use and go or you you program and i'll say no i'm actually no i'm a i'm actually a recruiter you know and then i Slightly and you wait. Ten, a tense up, <laughs> a tense up, and then we, then we usually exchange. Like, then they usually tell me a story of the a nightmare they've had with a recruiter, and uh, you know, and then you know it it goes from there really. I mean, everyone's oh God, got, I have to imagine everybody's got a recruiter story. Even me on this podcast, I had a positive one. Everyone's got a recruiter story, like, um, but. But those are, I, 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 I think that these are, you have to think about recruitment is that it's such a low barrier to entry industry and it's sold, as like I said at the beginning, it's sold as a, you can make a lot of money really quickly and it's, all you have to do is X, Y, Z, as if X, Y, Z is the easiest thing you can possibly do in the world. And you get into that environment and, you know, you've got recruiter who's new to the job has maybe two months to, to do something or they're out, or they get cut. Um, six months if you're at a more sort of forward thinking recruitment agency it might give you six months but you know you haven't got very long and in that time these people are desperately trying to do whatever they can to, to get a, to get, make something happen and unfortunately a lot of the times what they're doing is probably the exact opposite of what they need to be doing and it's actually in the meantime it's creating a a trail of disaster behind them that that you know the people tell me about at conferences basically <laughs> uh, it's a long-term game of building trust and relationships you can't it's it's a long-term game i think any sort of business related to relationships is a long-term game and you have to be able to survive long enough for that fruit to to bear right exactly and, yeah and, and these companies are not allowing it yeah i think it has the thing about recruitment for me is that it's not about me you know, it's about this, this, let's call them the candidate. It's about their life and it's about the company that they're looking to maybe they're investigating joining. Yeah. And it's about them. It's not about me. It's, it's not about, you know, it's not about like you're the third person I'm going to place this month. They, they don't care about that. It's not, they don't, you know, they don't care. It's no, it doesn't mean anything to their life if, um, if, if I don't get you persuade you to go to this interview today that my boss is going to have a massive go at me they don't that's not what it's about and that gets lost in big agencies and it becomes about the recruiter thinks everything's around them and they and the people aspect of it actually gets pushed to one side and it's, it becomes a commodity you know the candidate's a commodity i don't really care if you if you know what you're feeling about anything as long as you take the job i don't really care i think that's where it's, the knob of the problem in recruitment is that people, 
you know, think it's about them and it's actually not, it's about the candidates and it's about people making life choices, you know, that are really important. You know, I don't believe it's anything magical you can say that's persuade anyone to do anything, to be honest. I think people make up their own mind based on, you know, their f facts presented to them. No, and you gotta have morals and ethics around making sure that this is improving somebody's life. They're not going backwards. Exactly. They're, they're, th this, this is good for them in, in every aspect of their life, not, not just, and that's, I think it's lost too. You know, I've seen that from you. I, I felt that from you. So again, I've, I've had good experiences for the most part, but I, maybe it's, I've gotten lucky or, but that's, if I were to, I mean, I, I kind of do some level of recruiting too, right? Like I'm, we hire people. I, I, I try to make it really clear that we're, I've had friends who've wanted to work here and I've said no. What you got right now is 10 times better than what I could ever offer you. I'm not, not gonna hire you even if you beg me at this point. Like, no, stay where you are, right? And I think that's putting somebody first. So that's, that's amazing, man. No, that's the key. To me, it's, uh, I'll present people with the facts and they can make their own mind up. And everyone's, you know, you got your reasons for moving or whatever, that's, that's fine. I'll show you what, a, what this job is about. And if you wanna take it, you can take it. If you don't, you don't, it doesn't matter to me but the constantly pushing people to make a decision and creating false deadlines and you know, all this stuff is just, just pointless for me. So what are you seeing now? I mean, you're, you're well-established in, in, in Go. If somebody's listening to this and they're in Europe and they're looking to break into a Go job, uh, Martin's definitely the person you should talk to. He'll bare minimally tell you what you're lacking and what you need to do. And, and then come over to me and we'll help you uh, We'll help you get there, for sure. <laughs> we we want people yeah. to be working in there and go. But is there other tech that you're you're starting to kind of look at or see or think that is that next? I mean, you you somebody who likes to try to stay ahead of the curve or find that niche. Is there not to give away secrets, but <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no. The only the only thing I've you know the only conversations I've had with people on. You know, on regarding any other areas would be around Rust, say. But I haven't really looked at it enough to see, you know, I'm so busy with Go that I haven't looked at it yet. But I, I was thinking, you know, because I like to be in a niche and Go's becoming more and more widespread, it's almost hard, it's hard to be in a niche and Go now, <laughs> almost in a way. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm keeping my eyes open for, for something new, but you know, there's, there's such a demand in Go right now, it's... Uh... Do you focus at all on any of the ops side of things because we're seeing a demand not just for software development but also more and more ops stuff you know managing their kubernetes cluster sre kind of stuff do you focus on any of that i do a bit of it but my my, my, my main area is more so the development side but I do it does come hand in hand in some cases and i have placed you know devops people um but the majority of stuff i do is sort of development and I've been talking to people recently because I mean, going back to like what happened to me and then with my first company where I was finding these people who, who had skills and they could work in this industry, but they couldn't make the transition. I mean, this, I think this is a, I'm seeing that in this world now. I mean, everyone's coming to me looking for a senior developer. Like everyone's looking for a senior developer. And, and then, I get a, I, I speak to maybe 20 or 30 people a week who are not senior developers, but who have, I think have got something that's worth, you know, worth developing. And, um, and I'm trying to advise them on how to, how to try and break through. Cause you know, I have t companies tend to come to me when they need a senior. I don't, I very rarely in my time, in the last six years, I very rarely have placed anyone straight out of uni, for example, or or you know in their first or second job it's 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 quite rare i've done it a few times but not not that many and i used to think it was because you know they were getting enough applicants from direct to do that with but from talking to people recently it seems like no one's very few people are hiring actually <laughs> junior developers or people haven't got the bandwidth to, to mentor them so they're you know the story i hear a lot is we're all senior here and we're trying to build something and we're not at the we haven't got the bandwidth yet to mentor juniors so we need to hire some more seniors and then we'll be able to hire juniors and um i know the whole transition to remote has thrown another spanner in the works there with you know trying to f 
how do you onboard juniors and, and develop them on a remote basis? You know, that's another aspect. So, you know, I've been thinking, that's what I'm thinking about recently is trying to, trying to maybe work thinking about ideas about, I know, getting that funnel of juniors in at the bottom because eventually we're going to run, you know, we're going to run out of people. We're already running out anyway. There's not enough senior, there aren't enough seniors for everyone who wants to hire one. So this is a whole nother podcast and I've been fighting through this too this year because I'm the same thing. Everybody wants senior, quote unquote, and then the interview process and some of the, some of the interviewing is so, I, I don't think I could pass some of the interviewing. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't. I, I almost want to come up with a fake name and a fake picture and go through the process and be told no. Because I really think some of it is, is way beyond what they really need. You need people who are not going to be vampires, who are going to be good team players and positive, who can take direction and work on their own. They don't have to be experts. Like you can teach engineering through PRs. You can teach engineering through code review. What you can't teach is the programming. This is what I say. Programming is get this thing to work. Like, I don't have time to teach that. I don't care what the code looks like. Just get it to work. Then we can mentor around the engineering. This is what these, a lot of these teams don't understand. Hire the programmers, the intermediate, say, level, uh, high-end junior level programmers who you give them a task. This is my interview, okay, every time I'm, I'm hiring somebody. There's a website out there that has this API. I want you to build a, 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 a small program in Go, don't make it look pretty, please, that you register, you get your API key, you make the calls, you show me some data. And if it looks pretty, we're in tr you're in trouble because I don't want you to engineer. Just get it to work, right? And so I'm, I'm starting to get at Arden more and more project-based work where I can put myself and another senior, say, engineer on that, and then I just want to hire intermediate and juniors. And I want to develop people where we can still make our deadlines, but we develop. And again, what are you developing? It, the engineering skill, not the, the programming skill. And, I, and I'm looking for a way to try to tell the industry that this is what you need. There's so many amazing developers out there that are not working because they can't pass your engineering test, which honestly, I don't think I can. It's, it's horrible. So you and I are in the same, we're, we're, we're thinking about the same things every day. Yeah. It's definitely. really hard. You need project-based work that lends itself to developing. I, I could take anybody who's a programmer and give me three to six months and I can make them a solid engineer. I can, uh, solid enough to work on all these projects. I know I can. I think it's a big, it's a big issue. Like I'd go for, at the GopherCon UK last week, I, I, I was, I must've had six or seven different conversations with people about the same thing. Everyone's looking for seniors. <laughs> and uh, I mean, while well, uh, everyone who is a senior has got, is, seems to have mo too much work to do. So, you know, the prospect of them being able to mentor anyone is, is far, you know, far away. And what they're not understanding is the companies, the big, big companies are overpaying for the senior. I, 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 let's just be honest from an industry perspective. People are being paid more than what they're worth in many cases to the point where I had this conversation last week. I said to somebody, I cannot pay you this. Even though company A is going to pay you this, I, ca I cannot morally or ethically pay you that because I don't think that's where you're at right now in your skill set. They want to pay, pay it, go for it. But Make sure that somebody else was willing to pay you the same salary because if it doesn't work out over there and you've created a cost of living for yourself based on that salary and you can't get it again, what are you going to do, right? Like that's where the moral and ethic, ethical part is. This is what I know you're worth from 30 years and I know this is what you can get tomorrow as well. Try to, try to stay within that, right? So now what happens is you're, you're hiring all these senior people at these ridiculous rates, and then, yeah, what are you going to do? You're not going to be able to pull anybody else out unless you're going to increase salary again. You have an entire work pool that is ready to take the reasonable salaries if you just take the three months to develop the engineering side. Do we could have a whole podcast here on this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, I know, I know places that have been looking for a senior for probably as long as it would take to make a senior, you know, <laughs> you know, so, but obviously there's a lot of pressure on people to, to hit deadlines or produce 
you know, get products to a certain place before they can get the next line, you know, less their next investment or whatever. So I know there's pressure on everyone, and um, but I just think maybe the models need to be revamped a bit to allow for the, the juniors to get in there. So the way I did it on my teams is I never took a daily programming task. So for whatever work I had to get done that week, I had none of it on my plate. My job all week was to talk engineering, review code, do PRs, get people up to date. That was my job all week. That will allow you to bring in an intermediate or junior dev because you have that one mentor team lead who's driving the project and has the time to work with everybody all week. Every morning is, how's everybody doing? Where are we? Who's behind? What do you need? And then you make yourself. That is how, that's how this could work. But if that same, if I had 40 hours of programming on my back as well, no, you can't do it. So these teams have to start bringing in, no, team lead mentors that can run architecture and do design, but that's what their job is. And Martin, you know as well as I do, you take somebody who's younger and develop them for your team and your guidelines and your design philosophies, that person's gonna be 10 times better than the senior you brought in that already has a whole bunch of bias and baggage on how to do things. You're actually better off developing people on your products than, right, in the short-term cost, yeah, but long-term, I don't know. Yeah, plus retention, retention rates are, um, will be much improved as well. People you have actually taken time to develop will definitely stick around for a lot longer and with you for the rest of the journey. They will, they appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, there's a lot of talk around diversity and how we can build a diverse team and everything else. And I think unless you're hiring juniors, that's just, that's not gonna happen. It's just impossible. Yeah, it's one of those, I'm still thinking about, you know, potential ways of making it happen. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what, what to do yet, but I, I think I will do something eventually around this. Well, let me know what you come up with because I'm thinking about it all the time and I've got some ideas and strategies, but it does require companies coming in and, and wanting to do more project work than say staff og and and having reasonable expectations of delivery right for for things if you can do that you can develop an entire workforce around it all right so we're we're basically out of time we got like three more minutes i really appreciate you taking the time today a couple more questions so are you at least still playing music even on the yes. side look what do you what, no, Here, I see all the yeah. guitars. <laughs> they're, all, they're all there. I mean, they're not just, uh, they're not just gopher um, uh, stands. No, yeah, I still, I still do a lot of music. I, you know, I write a lot of music, and uh, it's what keeps, me, what keeps me ticking. And I've recently picked up the piano again, and I've started trying to teach, just try to learn some, some pieces again there as well. So music's definitely a daily part of my life. Have the kids taken to the music? Have you have, have the kids? Yeah, they're both they're both learning the piano at the minute. So um, with kids, it's a slow burn, isn't it? I remember because I like I said I hated practicing, but I'm glad my parents didn't let me stop playing. You know, because it definitely helps you when you're when you're a lot older, and you need to switch off. It's uh, it's it's there for you, isn't it? So yeah, both my kids are both my kids are playing the piano at the minute. It's brilliant. My dad was a musician. And I ended up getting a guitar and a computer like the same week. We know which one yeah. went out. So <laughs> I didn't They're do that. They're not incompatible. <laughs> no, I don't know. I just, I didn't put time into it. And I have, out of the five kids, I have one, my youngest one, who's starting to have some, he's getting an interest in it. So uh, it's interesting. All right, Martin, if anybody needs to or wants to reach out to you after listening to this, what is the best way someone can um, find you on the internet? Yes, we will. I'm in the Gopher Slack. I'm at, at Martin underscore Gallagher, I think. And I'm on Twitter. I'm at, at M Gallagher 2010. And um, you can find me at Vistas Recruitment is the name of my company. So VistasRecruitment.com is my website. You can always reach me there as well. Those are the, the main main ways to, to get hold of me. We'll get those. We'll get that on the show notes as well. All right. I really appreciate the uh, the hour here with you. I, I love I love the story, and I was really interested in how you ended up with the engineering background and the schooling, and now what you do is help engineers. I think it's awesome. Well, I really enjoyed the chat, Bill. It's been uh, it's been quite therapeutic for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so this is Bill Kennedy and Martin Gallagher saying goodbye and hope to see everybody again real soon.